Let's begin this morning uh, with our passage, which is from John chapter 13. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 17. The Gospel of John chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, and I'm reading from the NIV. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not now realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said that not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There is a core question at the heart of this passage. Jesus directed the disciples to ask it of themselves, and it is the same question that you and I must ask if we are to understand our Lord Jesus, both in this scene that we have just read and honestly in everything else that we know about him. And that question is this. Do we understand what he has done for us? Now, in order for us to be able to uh, consider this question as the disciples did, Let's consider for a moment what the disciples' experience had been like for the past three years that they had spent with Jesus up to this point. So if the world had photography back then, if somehow either, you know, pictures or images of some kind, if there was some way that we could just look back and take a look at what the real Jesus looked like, if we had pictures or images to see, I think we would be shocked at how mundane they are. Jesus didn't look like anybody of any particular importance. He was born to ordinary parents. His father had an ordinary job. Jesus' education and his family connections, by all standards, would have looked commonplace. He had no particular advantages. He wasn't born into wealth or into a family of any significant social or economic or governmental connections. And when Jesus began his ministry, he didn't go uh, recruiting extraordinary people to join him. Instead, the majority of the disciples, at least seven of the disciples that he recruited were sure of, were fishermen. He recruited uh, an outcast and a traitor in Matthew, who served the Roman oppressors as a tax collector, And he also recruited a Jewish zealot in Simon, uh, which I'm sure created all kinds of political tensions among the uh, disciples, which could not have been that much fun for anybody, I would imagine. 
All this to say there was nothing either about Jesus' own position or the people whom Jesus recruited that makes any sense, at least any common sense, for those of us who would look on and see someone who was trying to bring about a powerful change in the world, someone with no connections and someone who seemingly isn't trying to make powerful connections. Where are the people of power? Where are his influencers? Where are his wealthy contributors? This is not how revolutions get underway. You need connections. You need resources. You need to surround yourself with people who can advance the cause. Not only did Jesus not recruit such people into his inner circle, he seemed to continually challenge and undermine people of position. The people who held positions of governmental or religious authority or wealth were consistently offended by Christ and his lack of respect for the positions they held. We would have expect, uh, expected Jesus to make powerful allies, to surround himself with people whom others would take notice, allies who would lend him some credibility. Instead, Jesus surrounded himself with nobodies and made a lot of enemies among the important people who could have given him and his mission some acceptable social momentum. But Jesus' credibility didn't come from these common sources like so many expected. They didn't come from wealth or social position. It came in another form that the Gospels often described as authority. People who encountered Jesus were never the same afterward, and it was because he spoke, he taught, and he lived his life with what people could only seem to describe with this word authority. And even though there was nothing special about his appearance or his social connection, somehow people were aware that when they were with Jesus, they were in the presence of of an authority, a different kind of authority. It was almost unrecognizable to them because it wasn't the appearance of authority that they were used to. It wasn't authority that came from money or powerful positions. In fact, Jesus seemed blind to the authority that the world does recognize. He was not impressed by titles. He was not impressed by power or money, such people were so often turned away from Jesus, saddened or more often angered, that Jesus refused to recognize their status, the positions which they depended upon, which kept them in the lives that they wanted to live. They often had no need of Jesus, and Jesus had no need of them. And I think that was the most insulting point of all, that Jesus had no need of their influence or their power or their wealth. He had no need or use for them. And this astounded not only them and the people who were nearby to see these encounters, but it also astounded Jesus' own disciples. Jesus needed none of what the world valued to accomplish his purpose. What these powerful people valued so highly, Jesus didn't value at all. And it was part of what ensured that Jesus would be put to death. Jesus wasn't impressed by these things that impressed everyone else. Instead, Jesus was impressed by humble faith and honest service, it didn't seem to matter to Jesus where he found it, whether it was in the leper whom no one else would touch, or the Roman centurion who represented the enemy of the people, or the traitorous tax collector, or even the convicted thief who hung on the cross next to him. They had nothing to offer to Jesus, and he offered himself to them anyways. This the disciples had seen over and over and over again in their time with Jesus. And apparently they still 
weren't getting it. And so Jesus asks them again, do you understand what I have done for you? In the upper room during his last meal with his disciples, his last chance to address them all together before he would be betrayed and arrested and tried and crucified. At this moment, Jesus did something that shocked the disciples. And Peter's response, I think, demonstrated just how little they understood this lesson that Jesus had been teaching them. The primary lesson, the reason why Jesus had no use for military might, or the powerful connections, or the wealth that the disciples were constantly expecting him to value and pursue, and therefore they were confused by. And that lesson is this, that God's power is humble. And that's not a contradiction in terms. God's power is opposed to and has absolutely no use for the power structures of the world. The powerful in the world are the ones, uh, the ones whom the world bends over backwards to serve. But the powerful in God's kingdom are the ones who do the serving. And that's also not a contradiction, even though to us so often it feels like somehow it must be. Jesus grabbed a towel and he began to wash his disciples' feet. This was the job of a slave. This was the job of the lowest of the low on the social ladder. This is something that normal people do not do, much less the the privileged and the powerful of society. And Peter viscerally reacts when he sees Jesus preparing to wash his own filthy feet. What are you doing? Jesus, it looks like you're about ready to wash my feet. And Jesus said, yes, that's exactly what I'm about to do, Peter. And in a moment of defiance, we see Peter outright refuse. No, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus. This is so not right. Jesus is the leader, right? Jesus is the one that they are following. If anything, they should be washing Jesus' feet. The disciples had quarreled a bit uh, in the meantime on where they were going to fall in the org chart of Jesus' new kingdom. But there was one thing that was indisputably true in the org chart of God's kingdom. Jesus was at the top. Power comes from the top down and service goes from the bottom up, right? That's how it works. And Jesus' response to Peter revealed just how important it was to understand that that vision of power, the world's vision of power, was not only wrong, but completely unacceptable in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you have to accept this from me, Peter. Otherwise, you can have nothing to do with me. Do we understand what Jesus has done for us? Do we understand the story that follows this story in the Gospels? The evening that happens after their meal in the upper room, when Jesus willingly walks the path that leads to the cross. He, our Lord and our God, has washed our feet. He has taken the dirtiest, filthiest parts of our lives into his own hands and cleansed them. It's not something that we can do for him. And if we refuse it, we refuse him. And we can't earn it. We can't do anything to deserve it. Because it's not about us. Jesus didn't wash his disciples' feet because they were so high up on the org chart. It wasn't about who the disciples were. Jesus didn't go to the cross for us because of who we are. He did it because of who he is. Jesus is God, and because Jesus is God, 
He looked upon his disciples the same way that God looked upon his disciples, and in the same way that God looks upon all of us that we talked about a couple of weeks ago as beloved children. God is love, and God loves what God has made. And love looks with a blessed purpose. When love finds fault or sees failure or brokenness, love's purpose is redemptive. It is restorative. Love is self-giving and it is humble. Love is patient and kind. It has no use for envy or pride. Love honors others and keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not seek to be served, but to serve. Love always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Love never fails, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, and God is love. Our almighty, everlasting Father, the creator of all things, is love. Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet is the powerful, merciful humility of God's love on display for the disciples to see and experience one last time while they are all together. John opened our passage in such a way that we could not miss this point when he said Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world He loved them to the end. Jesus saw not only his disciples, but everyone he met through that lens, the lens of love. Jesus saw the poor, the outcast, the downtrodden as his sisters and brothers, and he loved them as such, even though they had nothing to offer him in return. And Jesus saw the socially important, the powerful, the wealthy as nothing more than his sisters and brothers. Nothing more than his sisters and brothers. And he loved them as such, despite all they had to offer him. This vision of love, powerful in humility, is what Jesus tried again and again to teach his disciples to pass on that they could adopt for themselves his vision of the world. But the disciples so often pushed back against this vision of the world and demonstration of power, because it is not the vision that they wanted nor the power they understood. And so often the same is still true for us, at least I know it's still true for me, 2,000 years later. I want to believe that God is on my side. I want to believe that of the teams that exist in life, God is on my team. When the reality is that God is on the side of all creation. And if I accept God's love for me, I must accept that it's not because of anything that I've done to deserve God's love, but only because God has called me who I am only because I am a part of God's beloved creation. And so is everyone else around me. The Bible says that God is unconditional love. But that means then that there aren't any special conditions that I've met to be worthy of God's love. I can never not have it. I can never escape God's vision of love, and neither can anyone else. I am no more loved by God than my enemy is. And if I am, if I dare to receive God's love, if we choose to allow Jesus to wash us, to cleanse us, then His love must become our own. His vision of the world 
must becomes must become the the lens through which we see the world and those around us. Do you understand what I have done for you? Jesus asked the disciples. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am, Jesus said. He wanted them to understand that his loving service to them, his washing their feet, did not make him lesser than they were. It did nothing to change the status, the structure, the shape of the pyramid. Jesus is still at the top of the org chart, and he had to spell it out for them because that's the assumption that he knew was going to go through their minds. He says, I, the guy with the towel holding your dirty, stinking feet in my hands, I am your God. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And if we allow Jesus, our Lord and our God, to love us, a love we could never deserve but only receive, how much more are we to offer our love to others? We are not greater than he who loves us, nor are we greater than he who sends us into the world with a message of love and redemption, good news for all the people. What does this mean for us today? What difference does this make? Well, these are challenging times, to say the least. These are times when I think we are especially tempted to be selfish, to be self-serving, to see strangers and even our neighbors as threats and nothing more. But that is not the vision that our Lord has taught us to have. We are surrounded by heavenly siblings, the people whom God has given to us to serve in his name, as his followers, as his messengers, as bearers of his love. Quite honestly, this means not hoarding. This means caring for the needs of others as we care for our own needs. This means if we've got toilet paper at home, that we leave that last package of toilet paper on the shelf for someone else who needs it more. This means that for those of us who have plenty, that we find ways to serve our neighbors who might be in need. It means picking up the towel that Jesus picked up for us and getting our hands dirty, because that is what our Lord and God did, and we are not greater than he. The challenge for us this week is to do something that helps us move closer to adopting God's vision of the world. Maybe we know someone in need whom we could serve. Maybe we leave that last bottle of soap or Kleenex or toilet paper on the shelf. Or maybe we offer our extra to someone else who has has none. Find an opportunity this week to love like Christ, to pick up the towel, and to care for the good of someone else as we care for our own good. Do we understand what Jesus has done for us? If so, now that we know these things, Jesus said, we will be blessed if we do them too. Let's pray. God of all creation, thank you for loving us. Your way of seeing and serving the world is difficult for us to do, and we need your help to do it faithfully. Give us your spirit, the spirit that lived in Christ, that serves and loves with both power and humility. 
Give us your vision of the world and of the people around us that we would not see our neighbors as a threat, but as a sibling, as someone whom you've given to us to be bearers of your blessing toward. God, give us wisdom. Give us patience. Give us grace and mercy for ourselves and those around us that we may endure this wilderness without giving into the temptations of fear and selfish desires. God of all grace, mercy, and love, make us truly your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the benediction from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.